Hello, today we'll be talking about two concepts from signal processing called sparse coding and dictionary learning and how we would implement these now on graphs. The idea of sparse coding is to take any signal uh, F and rewrite it in terms of a different basis, which is called a dictionary consisting of atoms in such a way that the representation in this dictionary, even though it might be longer, is sparser, meaning it only has a few atoms chosen here. So here we're thinking about the idea that a recipe is a signal F, the input signal. So now you could list out every ingredient in the recipe, like chilies and tomatoes and onions and whatnot, but that would form a very dense representation. It wouldn't be very sparse. But instead, our atom cleverly contains combinations of ingredients that are often used together. For example, all of the ingredients used in guacamole or all of the ingredients used in salsa. So if you were only encoding, for example, Mexican cuisine recipes, this would be a really good dictionary because often you could just use one, one or two of these combination atoms and be done. For example, if you're making guacamole, for example, you'd only choose this maroon atom and that would be it. And that's sort of the idea of having a cleverly designed or learned dictionary of atoms and then being able to code signals sparsely with respect to that. So just to give this a little bit more mathematical nuance, we start with an input signal or signals Y and an overcomplete dictionary of atoms. What overcomplete means is that these atoms are not orthogonal or orthonormal with one another like the eigenbases which is just sort of just enough. It also means that there's more than one way of representing a signal using this dictionary of atoms. And then once you have this overcomplete dictionary then basically the task of sparse coding is to find these sparse coefficients such that you have a succinct representation of your original signal Y in this new basis which is given by the dictionary capital B, D. The dictionary, as I said, can contain either well-chosen atoms or you can even learn the atoms of a dictionary. And I'm going to go over that in just a second. Some examples of choices of atoms for signals on graphs are eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian, filtered versions of eigenvectors of graph Laplacians, graph wavelets, or something a little bit more complicated like polynomials of the graph Laplacian. Here we have the, this graph, the same common graph with several signals on it. But you see what the atoms could be. The atoms could be this set of signals up here, which perhaps all three of these signals would load to. Or a signal on this arm over here, which these two would load to. And so this is how you go about creating atoms on a graph. There are often localized signals on the graph that other signals may or may not have components in. The classic sparse coding optimization is to recreate original signal Y as a linear combination of atoms in capital D using coefficients X such that the number of coefficients that are non-zero is less than some threshold T. This is indicated by this L0 norm which just counts how many non-zero entries there are in your particular vector of x. But once you have this L0 norm here, this is not a convex optimization. This is non-convex and it's often solved by a greedy method called matching pursuit. Matching pursuit just involves finding the best atom that loads the highest to your signal and then computing the residual of that uh, after the loading and then repeating the first step and continuing this until you've represented your complete signal. So that's how you find the sparse coding with respect to a given dictionary. But you could also learn a dictionary simultaneously. And one of the first and best known algorithms for this is called KSVD. It was invented back in 2006 by Aharon and colleagues. So this actually involves just two steps. There's a sparse coding stage, which does exactly what we said, with an initial dictionary matrix D0. And then it involves a code update step, which actually reconfigures the dictionary. 
And the way it does it is very specific. It goes through all your atoms in the dictionary one by one, and it says, what happens if we didn't use this atom? It looks at all the input example signals that use that atom, and then it computes the new error. And it actually just kind of restricts the error to just all of the atoms used by those examples. And then it applies SVD and chooses the first singular vector as the new atom, which is a replacement for one of your original atoms. And this process continues until you get to a local minimum. So again, the key to the SVD algorithm is thinking about what happens when you remove a particular atom and just looking at the examples uh, where those atoms are being used and looking at their new error function. So in the graph setting, you can also do sparse coding and you can do dictionary learning. You could use the same optimizations that I just showed you, or you can do something specific with respect to graph structure. Now, a lot of times, in graph signals, one of the tests is to denoise the signal, as we've talked about before. So instead of getting a sparse signal, you might want a signal that's smooth on the graph. And you can alter the optimization of sparse coding in this way. So again, you have this reconstruction error where you're trying to recreate the signal as a linear combination of dictionary items. But instead of constraining this to be sparse, I'm now constraining it to be smooth over the graph Laplacian using this quadratic form with some regularization parameter that tells you how important it is. But now notice that this optimization is actually convex and can be solved faster, for example, by gradient descent. Here, um, we can also learn dictionaries um, with, that have some kind of information from the underlying graph. So we already talked about KSVD, but in 2014, Tanao et al. came up with a dictionary learning algorithm that uses the graph structure. Here what they're trying to do is make the atoms localize on the vertices of a graph. So we already saw the examples of graph signals where you might want atoms that are localized in specific areas of the graph. So the way they're doing that is actually now they are not no longer trying to learn the sparse coding of signals, but rather they're trying to learn the, the dictionary, which now they consider a concatenation of D1 through DS subdictionaries. And each dictionary is actually a polynomial of the graph Laplacian. And they have some additional constraints to ensure that these subdictionaries um, have nice forms just like the graph Laplacian and uh, small eigenvalues um, and so on. But the basic gist is that each of these dictionaries consists of atoms that are some coefficient sk times the eigenvalue to the power of k. And uh, when you multiply by the eigenvectors and the eigenvectors conjugated, you see that you have a polynomial of the graph Laplacian. In fact, the authors of this paper showed that their polynomial dictionary uh, was very similar to a dictionary that they use based on the graph structure and mining the graph structure, and that in particular it was giving a lot better results than other uh, methods, including the green method, which was the KSVD method. Some of the applications of sparse coding and its variants, whether it's smooth co coding and dictionary learning, are that you can come up with very sparse or compressible representations of signals on graphs. And then you can compare these signals. Let's take, for example, the flow of traffic on a city street. The city street can be thought of as a graph that links places. And we want to compare the flow of traffic on Sunday mornings to Tuesday afternoons. And how would you do that? You can think of the traffic as a particular signal that has certain values um, on, the ver on different vertices or certain values on the edges. And then you can encode those as graph signals. You can re-represent them 
And you could even directly compare them in a way that really tells you what's different. Like there's traffic in this neighborhood on one of the days and traffic in this neighborhood on the other day. Or you can think about another graph, a graph of neurons, which I've illustrated here. Neurons uh, activate. And you can think of these activations as a signal on a neuronal adjacency graph which people often do in fMRI. And you can compare different brain activation states. There's many other ways of using these particular powerful tools.